you know, thankfully I have a really good support system. Um, so I, I sat down with, with my girlfriend and she's an entrepreneur too. And so she's been there and in that world for me, like when you have a bad day, talking about it and just getting it off the chest is good and talking about it, you know, leads into that question of like, okay, so what are you going to do about it? Welcome to Increase the Dosage. This is the show that strips away the facade of fake entrepreneurship. It removes the glamour, comes from the trenches, and provides the naked conversations, war stories, lessons learned, and the tools and tricks used by the successful entrepreneurs who overcame their challenges to achieve new growth so that you can too. Now, for your weekly shot of entrepreneurial adrenaline, here is your host, serial entrepreneur and venture catalyst, Chris J. Snook. Welcome everybody, Chris J. Snook here for the inaugural episode of Increase the Dosage, the official podcast of Startup Drugs and StartupDrugs.com. That's with a Z. Welcome to the show. I am excited today to talk with someone I met several years ago who has got one of the coolest companies, I think, in our ecosystem that I've seen. I hate to say that and, and like naming your favorite child, but I'm, I'm super excited about this and we'll get into some of the reasons why I, I kind of have a special affinity for this brand and this gentleman um, who I met in Colorado several years ago while we were in that ecosystem doing some things. Without further ado, I'm going to welcome R.T. Custer, who is the founder and CEO of Vortic Watches to the show. R.T., thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Chris. So uh, when did you start this company? I, I'm trying to remember if you started it the year we met or what, what, what year did you start Vortic? Well, technically, we had the idea for Vortic Watch Company on the golf course at Penn State, uh, Tyler and I, in 2013. And it really launched, I would say, on Kickstarter in uh, November of 2014. That's that's when we met. I think my Kickstarter was live um, in late 2014. Yeah, I believe at the time we were organizing in the Fort Collins ecosystem. We had started organizing underneath that launch no code banner, and we had a, one million cups and some other things. And you guys were one of the presentations. And I have a weird memory that remembers numbers really well. I don't remember a lot of other things, but I, I believe at the time you had done you know, $10,000 worth of sales as a goal in the Kickstarter, but you were already well over 40 or something like that. And and so we kind of had you come tell that story because people were, hey, interested in how you did so well on Kickstarter because a lot of people weren't doing well on Kickstarter at that time. But yeah, so tell us a little bit about Vortec. One of, one of the things I'll say, just because it's my favorite piece of how you position this thing was you got in the watch business at a time where digital is all the rage and certainly today is uh, even more so. Um, and you got in the watch business and you were, I'll let you kind of explain what the vision was and everything else. But the thing that you said that immediately hooked me was we don't sell time pieces. We sell conversation pieces. And and the minute I heard that, I was like, tell me more. So what is Vortic Watches? And, and, you know, contextualize this for us, too, because you said you started this with a buddy at Penn State, Tyler, who, who I also know. But was this when you first became an entrepreneur or was there some other like when did you realize you know, if even if you didn't call it that, that you were an entrepreneur or wanted to be one. Yeah, well, I mean, going going way back, I, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My great grandfather started a Christmas tree farm in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, in 1941, because he had worked for the state of Pennsylvania as a forester for 25 years without receiving a raise, hmm. and he said, "Enough, enough is enough. I'm going to do my own thing." And you know, that was. Um, World War II, right? But people at home, um, you know, wanted to celebrate Christmas and uh, Christmas trees were were big business back then. And so, and he he had a a high level degree in, in forestry. And and his son, my my grandfather, uh, went to Duke and got a doctorate in forestry. And so we ran a Christmas tree farm. That was my mom's side of the business or my mom's side of the family. And I grew up on the farm and I was selling trees when I was five years old. So. <laughs> so you you yeah. were one of these you were one of these guys that was born into an entrepreneurial family and kind of didn't really know any different, you know, you just kind of what your family did and you not everybody then adopts the lifestyle, meaning not everyone that's in an entrepreneurial family stays or becomes an entrepreneur or whatever, but you kind of chose to do that. So at 5 years old you were kind of part of this family business. But what do you also remember about like any other times where you started to go out on your own or do your own thing? Like at what point did you want to do your own? Do you remember? Yeah. So in college, so I studied industrial engineering at Penn State. And when I was a freshman, 
I got approached by this MLM called uh, College Works Painting. And, and basically, um, you get to paint houses. You get to run your own franchise of a painting business for the summer. I think I remember those guys. I, I actually yeah. think I remember those guys coming around campus. We're, we're different generations. I'm, I'm a little bit older than you, but I, I think I remember those guys pitching people on campus. Well, and it's, you know, that's a comp, like, I think there's several college painting MLM style businesses, but I, I didn't know, I didn't know what an MLM was at that time. I, didn't, I had no idea. It, it just, it sounded really cool. They called it an internship and I was hooked and I was like, that would be really cool to run my own business for the summer. And I don't know anything about painting, but I'm, I'm really good at sales. So I could probably make some money. And so I was one of the first engineers they ever hired. Typically, they focused on business majors, you know, communications made people that would traditionally be good at sales. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to go back and, and apply, I think, three or four times in order for them to, like, actually give me an interview. Like, I just kept knocking on that door. I was like, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> and finally, they let me do it. And um, I was number one in the state and number three in the nation that year out of thousands of people that did it. And I kicked ass at that job. And I, I remember the time I decided that I wanted to be an entrepreneur 100% was about halfway through that summer, um, we did a paint training where they taught us how to paint the houses. Like we're selling these things. We're going door to door. We're knocking on doors. We're telling you, you know, it's going to cost $5,000 to paint your house. Here's what it is. They taught us how to do the estimates and the sales. But then like you actually have to paint the houses that you sell. <laughs> and so they had this thing called paint training and um, it's me and, and my manager and all everyone on his team. And so there's like, I don't know, 20 of us all sitting around and I'm, I think I was the youngest one there, you know, freshman, 19 years old. And my manager, Joe, I'll never forget this. He hands me a can of paint and an opener, like a paint can opener and says, Hey, can you open this for us so we can get started? And he knew that I had never opened a can of paint before in my life. And it's not rocket science to open a can of paint, but you kind of have to know what you're doing. Like, you, you know, if you have never seen, like I'd never touched a can of paint before. <laughs> and they're all like, everyone's laughing at me because I can't open this can of paint. And I'm like, so embarrassed. And I'm like, you know, uh, you know, this engineer thinks he's smart, you know. And Joe, my manager says to all of them, he says, you guys think this is funny, but this kid who can't open a can of paint is currently kicking all of your asses in sales. He's never touched a pan can of paint in his life, and he's sold three times as many paint jobs as all of you combined. So let this be a lesson that all it takes is a lot of hustle. And when I got over the embarrassment of that <laughs> and realized the lesson that he was teaching them and me at the same time, I was like, holy crap this could be really cool. And then I went on to uh, do really well at the production side of things too, because that also like he was brilliant because that also inspired me to become a student and actually learn how to paint. And because I was like, shit, I really needed to learn how to do this. I think it's a great story. A lot of the, a lot of the, you know, audience we have are running companies like you that are, you know, in that several million dollar to, million, you know, like over a million and, and under maybe 30 million in, in volume, you know, kind of, uh, enterprises. Some are some are leading bigger things, or some have exited bigger things. But for the most part, that's that's the audience we serve. And you know, certainly there's the aspiring entrepreneur, the newbie entrepreneur that is at it. They're in the game. They're doing stuff. Maybe they've done a couple things, and they don't feel like they've had that one yet that that makes it. And they're looking for hacks and and things like that. But either way, I think it reminds us all of a story early on that created a lesson of a, a, an aha moment. But there's there's some meat on that one. Was the lesson that you gleaned from it then that a owning a business does not mean does not mean I have to be an expert in delivering the end product because I can hire people? What what was the lesson that you didn't have, but then when that was done, you you kind of went backwards? Because I can think of several that might have happened. Like, wow, I have a responsibility since I am selling this to understand how it's done because I need to know what I'm doing is good and, and selling is good and valuable and whatever. And at the same time, there's the other side of it. It's like, wow, I, I can hire someone to open paint. I just need to keep going sell. Like there's so many different nuances to that lesson. I'm just curious which one was the, was the initial one that jumped out at you and what you gleaned from it. 
So looking back at it, I, I think of two things. One is I did really well managing that business when it was all on me. Like all I had to do was I, I knocked on the doors, I sold the jobs, I booked the, the jobs, um, I hired the painters, and I scheduled those jobs to get done, and then I managed those painters and got it done. What I did not excel at was the next year when I moved up a level and had to manage other managers. Yeah. And as soon as I had to do that, I started failing. And so, you know, looking back on it, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? But looking back on it, that's that's when I should have realized, and it took me years, uh, really, to to come to this realization that I am a visionary. I am a really good salesperson. I can articulate the vision really well. And I can bring products to life, but not without the help of a team. And I probably should not be the direct manager of those teams because I have a hard time articulating the vision to the employees that I articulate to the customer. Does that make sense? Do you also feel like, and I don't know if this is true, I, I share similar awareness of myself. And so just tell me your version of this because it may be different than mine. But do you also feel that Part of the challenge is that when you're that self-reliant, which a lot of entrepreneurs are, especially sales-driven entrepreneurs, right? Where you know you could just manage your day and you could just pit, knock them down and set them up and knock them down and set them up and and it runs like clockwork. That that there's an expectation level that everyone is going to a do it your way, b do it on time at the same level that you would. And, and whether it's right or wrong, do you find that part of the challenge was when you when you struggled to make that transition in managing folks, that it was the expectation level you had of how it should go was not achievable because A, a single person doing it is different than a team or B, you were blocked on a, a different way to do it because it was the way that worked for you prior. Like what was, what was your version of, you know, causing that struggle, do you think? Do you have any insights now? Yeah, a couple of things. One is um, it's all about setting correct expectations. And this happens all the time in my current business, making watches. You know, if, if I say one thing in the sales process to a customer and then something else happens, right, wrong, or indifferent, that was not the expectation of the customer. And so that's one thing that can go wrong as you start delegating things. And, and, and if you need a team or ma a manufacturer or basically, if you're not doing 100% of the supply chain yourself, you're relying on somebody else. And regardless of what that person does or knows, if they don't do exactly what you said in the sales conversation, then the expectation was set incorrectly, and something appears to be wrong to the customer. So so that's that's one thing. And then what, what I realized to answer your question about myself is that I'm three steps ahead. Like my brain thinks five years from now, like I am, I'm already running a watch company that has a hundred employees and, you know, is running a massive manufacturing company with 50 machines and, you know, financing is just not an issue because we're a manufacturing company and all this stuff. When really today we have two machines and five people and, like I, I really should be more involved in the day to day because they need my help, and so um, that's one example. But I'm, I'm just, I'm so many steps out ahead that I, I have to bring myself back and and you know cool the jets, right, and uh, and come back to earth, yeah. um, and say no, but like this is where we are today. So uh, how do we set the expectation? Yeah, there's that. There's. Yeah, that's, that's really good stuff. I mean, I you know, there's that there's that fine balance of dealing in present reality and then shape shifting reality to where you know you're going. And and I say you know you're going not just because I know you, but I know people like you and us and, and, and entrepreneurs. Is is that what makes everything happen is this ability to reverse engineer a future we create and act not only act as if it's so, but just know that it is so. Right. Yeah. And like otherwise nothing would grow. So it's this like fine line of being a bullshit artist to yourself. And yet the the detail and the accountability and the responsibility side being enough where you you're not because you pull it through. 
like hell or high water, you will make that so because you said you would. But then the stress of and the and the collateral damage that happens sometimes when it typically never occurs on a timetable we set. It always happens. Right? What I've learned about entrepreneurs is it always one way or the other, they always get where they're going to go. It just never goes the way they say. And then the more mature we get, the more we hedge, but it still doesn't even go the way we hedge, right? Because there's this fine balance. Um, so, you know, that's, it's really cool that you had that insight in your, what, what were you like 20, 21 when that was? 19 at best. <laughs> and to be fair, I did not have that realization at that time, you know, at the time, Oh, sure. Yeah. No, you said it was several years, right? It was several years of grinding. And we'll come back to some some other things that, that maybe you learned through times of grind. But I, I want to pick up on, on a nuance you mentioned about communicating. You, you said something about, I realized, you know, after the fact, several years later, I realized that my ability to communicate the expectations I set in the sales process to, you know, the team was not there. And because I, I've been there and I can, I, I'm extrapolating a little bit, I think that where that breaks down, and I, I'm curious how you respond to this, when you're sitting with a prospect or a customer or someone, when you're in the sales process, especially when you're, when you're the entrepreneur that's leading, like some CEOs don't touch the sales process, right? But when you're the one who's like, in your case, touching the sales process, especially early on, you're so present, especially when you're a good salesperson, which you obviously are to the needs of that individual, that you're not changing the offer. You're almost with mastery getting to a place where you know the thing that they care about most. And so your brain and your body and your voice just highlights that. Meaning like they say something and whatever it is, I'm going to try and you know use the watch example because I'm trying to think of like, they think it's something about the certainty that their piece that they mailed in to you is going to not get lost in in between transit because it's a you know legacy piece or some heirloom that they want refurbished and that's their biggest hot button from an operations and a supply chain standpoint it's just a part of the process right we 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 send out a label we do this we check it in we do that and so for the team they they don't necessarily have the context you had where the thing that closed the deal was your emphasis on how well, you secure the asset in transit. In that unique use case, that was the thing that pushed the deal over, right? I'm just using an example. So then what happens is they run the sales process and or the supply chain process, and there's nothing wrong. They do it the same way they've always done it. But that customer had an expectation that their hand was going to get held because RT or whomever knew in, intuitively that that was the thing that they needed to, to be certain and it breaks down because one less email than they expected goes out or they don't hear from you for two days and they're stressed, right? And and so is it is it that when you mean communication, is it being able to, to articulate the nuance at scale of why someone chose to buy and then have that, you know, processed in? What, what is it that, that fails in the communication, do you think? Or what did in the paint business? In the paint business, it was, you know, it was totally different. It was... Um... It was more of, you know, scheduling, scheduling jobs and, and getting jobs done on time and finding the right employees. And, um, you know, every single house is, is different. So the, you have, you have different customers with different houses and different expectations, but in the, in the watch business, you know, it's, it's actually kind of similar because every watch that we make is one of a kind. And I don't, you know, I don't know how much background we've, we've gone into, but, you know, Vortec Watch Company salvages and restores antique American pocket watches and turns them into one-of-a-kind wristwatches. That's what we do. And so it's a very niche thing. And sometimes, like in the case that you referenced, we have customers that send us a family heirloom pocket watch and we turn it into a wristwatch. And that's what we did for you. And, and that's it's a small part of our business, but it's like... Yeah. It's, I think it's the best part because it's what tells the story. It's like the, the backbone of like our, our whole marketing really, you know, and preserve your legacy is what we say. Right. So, but, but yeah, exactly. It's like, it doesn't matter if you sent us a pocket watch or we're using one that we, that we did when you place the order, the customer has some sort of expectation on something, right? So on our website, it used to say custom orders take uh, six to eight weeks. And so, and, and you'll receive periodic updates throughout. 
the word periodic can mean a <laughs> lot of things to a lot of people. And so some customers expect like the Domino's pizza delivery tracker on like your pizza is currently in the oven and then it got picked up. Right. Like we don't, we don't have the, the bandwidth. Pepperonis are now right. on. Yeah. So we, you know, we're, we're a very small team. So we don't have the bandwidth to send every single customer an email anytime something little changes with their order. But, but again, that's something that's taken us years to like recognize for, for years. And, and it still happens today. You know, we get a customer that's frustrated and then they send us an email just checking in and we get frustrated too. Cause it's like, well, why, why did you feel the need to check in? Like it's, it's fine. Like you said, it's fine. It's part of our normal supply chain. Everything's great. It's just, you know, it, your, your particular order is going to take probably eight to 10 weeks instead of six to eight weeks. But you know, if that wasn't their expectation going in, then, you know, either the expectation needs to be reset or uh, we, we failed initially um, by, by creating that expectation. So anyway, recently what we did, and if you look at our watch builder today, it says most custom orders take about a month to process. But in some cases, it can take several months to make a perfect wristwatch out of a 100-year-old pocket watch. And what that's telling you is, you know, for the, for the analytical... You're not going to have this on Friday is what it's <laughs> Yeah. So for the, for the really analytical person like me, you know, they read into that and they're like, okay, that's one to three months roughly on how long it's going to take. Yeah. For some people, they read that and they say, cool. I'm getting a service that no one else in the world provides and I'm just going to let these guys do their job because sometimes it takes a while and that's fine. Now, to layer that on, once you place your order, you get an email with a link to our process page and that process page takes you through step by step. Here's what we do. You know, here's what we do first. Here's what we do next. And it tells you a, a time window. Like each step takes, you know, this one takes two to four weeks. This one takes, you know, two to three weeks. And, and so, you know, that way you can be educated through the process. And then it also says once the watch is restored, once the pocket watch is restored and our wristwatch is assembled, um, before we start our quality assurance process, you'll receive an email with pictures. And that's usually the one update that we send. All that to say, I used to say you'll get periodic updates kind of when we can, but when we can doesn't really happen if you scale a business to like now we make, you know, we're, we're going to make probably 500 watches this year. So if I try to send an email to every single customer every two weeks, I would have to hire another person just to send emails. And that's, that's not a good job. And that's not, that's a disservice to the customer to even set that expectation. So yeah. it's, it's, it's fascinating. Like that, that whole communication side, the root of it is setting the right expectation but at the same time, it, it tears me apart because if I could do it all, if I could clone myself, I would send the customers an update every seven days, you know, uh, maybe yeah, more than that. that that's, a, that's another nuance. I think that there's some good gold in here. I mean, what, you, what I think I hear you saying is that what you'd want to do is you would want to do the unscalable thing, which is yeah. communicate all the time with every one of your customers um, because that's, that's how you would like it. But what works for the business and the customer, but it it's what's working for the business is to not do that because there's not enough margin, there's not enough bandwidth, there's not enough need even necessarily to do that thing. So you can differentiate on customer experience, but one way you're choosing not to differentiate on customer experience is send as many emails as you would like if it was just you and, uh, and a bunch of people and you were making watches on the side, right? right? This is a company that needs to scale. This is a business and a brand. It is scaling. And so there's things that can't be done, even though you personally would like to do them. And you could because you're Superman. Well, and the and the kicker, Chris, is is um, is how you handle those situations. And that's where I think I've grown and, and everybody on the team has grown is, you know, if uh, I don't know, a year ago when we got an email from a customer asking, you know, hey, uh, how's it going or, or just checking in? You know, it's been a little while we would get frustrated and we would be like, you know, oh man, like this person needs another update, you know, and, and, and that's not fair. Like they, they paid us money up front and we're doing a job like, you know, it, it, there, there's nothing frustrating about that at all. 
so we we tried to flip the mindset of that to say, you know what, when this customer paid for this job to get done, they paid, you know, our average purchase probably two thousand dollars, so they paid us two thousand dollars, and um, you know we're making them a custom watch. So when they call or they send an email, I'm going to smile, I'm going to answer the phone, and and I'm going to educate, and that's that's the kicker, is you know let me take just an extra five minutes to tell this customer exactly what's going on, exactly what step their uh, you know, watch is in and what's going to happen next and really like happily share with them all the good, cool stuff that we do every day. And, and that's the game changer for us. And that's what I, when, I, when we started realizing that, it was like you know the customer that was a little frustrated because they just hasn't heard anything from us they would they would listen to that and they'd be like oh man like i didn't realize you did all that stuff that is so cool and and they flipped and then they went from a little frustrated to like thanking us for our time and like uh, you know apologizing for even calling you know what i mean cuz they're like holy crap you guys are so busy and and that's the difference is just taking that compassionate approach of like you know what we might not have set your expectation correctly in the beginning and we're really sorry about that here is what's happening right now here's what's going on and everything is great and and doing that education makes a huge difference yeah no so and and again it ties into the experience that you're selling and kind of even the product that you're selling uh, which is you know very personal, right? Something that someone's going to adorn themselves with on the watch. That's got this legacy history, whether it was an heirloom or whether it was one of the ones that you've found on the market and, and that you're refurbishing. Cause that's a core part of your business is this refurbishing of 90 and hundred year old time pieces that are American made with American made products. And then creating a one of a kind, you know, wristwatch out of it that, you know, not only looks sick, but that is truly something that doesn't exist anywhere else. Right. And doing that at a, at a price point that is, you know, extremely, uh, in my opinion, from a, from a value standpoint, extremely reasonable and yet not, you know, a high volume wristwatch, you know, that you, you can just go buy and, and forget about. So we've talked a lot about the highs. We've talked, you know, some really cool nuggets here about ways that you've, you know, processed in some of these insights into Vortic, but let's talk about a time where you had your, the wind knocked out of you. Maybe it's personally, maybe it's professionally, maybe it was in this business or a prior one doesn't matter to me. I think it's just part of every episode. What we're trying to do with the community and, and with entrepreneurs that have been successful like yourself is is also share times where you didn't have it. You know, you felt, and even if it was temporary, it might have been an hour, might have been a couple of days, might have been a month. It's different for everybody, but none of us have been in this game for real and not had a time where we just didn't know if we could move forward or we were scared, quite frankly. So you got a time that you're willing to share or, or something. And then the, the goal of this is to figure out you know, what did it really feel like so that so that other people that may be feeling that go, oh, yeah, yeah I, I know what that feels like or I'm feeling that right now. And then, you know, talk to us about some of the tips and like what did you deploy to get out of it? So pick one that, that you feel like is relevant and, and tell me about your pain. So probably the biggest failure that that we've had at, at Vortic was the second Kickstarter campaign that we launched in 2017. And that was for a product that honestly we still haven't launched, hmm. but we, we launched that new product on Kickstarter in 2017 and we called it the, and we still call it the journeyman series. And the idea was a fully modern watch that, um, didn't use an original antique pocket watch in it. It would be like our second product line and we would make most of it, you know, uh, as much as we could here in Colorado as much as we could in America, and it would be a unique design that was made by Vortic and actually have the word Vortic on the face of it instead of, you know, one of the old pocket watch companies um, that we do for our, our current uh, products and, and what we call the American Artisan Series. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was just a second, it was the launch of our second product line. You know, we did everything right. We built the Kickstarter campaign uh, the way everyone says, like we lined everything up. Um, we, we set up suppliers. We had prototypes there like we showed how we were going to make it we set up a a nationwide tour where we would take our prototypes from one major city to the next and you know basically show them to jewelry stores so we could try to sell, sell them there and then also have like little meetups with our customers around the country and sell that 
Um, we set the goal at $75,000 and we hit the goal in less than six hours. Wow. So you actually sold it out. Yeah. So we crushed the goal, but the problem was that wasn't really the goal, you know, and that's, that's what we did. So on, on Kickstarter, if you hit the goal, that's a really good thing. And that means the product's going to get made. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that's enough money to make the product. And we realized about, I don't know, I don't know, no, no, is into the campaign and seven or eight days into this like 40 day nationwide tour we were doing that we had lost the momentum. So um, we had an email list of maybe three or four thousand people at the time. And all the customers that we had following us that were going to buy had already bought. We, we weren't doing outreach. You know, we weren't finding new customers. We didn't get any PR hits. Like we th- put it all on the table and it all came out and we calculated that number and we hit it, but then we just stalled and we didn't, we stuck right at like 76, 77. Like we were just, we're selling like one watch a day on, you know, Kickstarter. It was just, it was terrible. And, and then I, you know, and we started in New York city. And so by the time I got to Detroit, uh, probably 10 days in, I got a call from one of the suppliers and basically he said, Hey, I looked at your Kickstarter and we can't actually do the thing that you are selling that you want us to do for you. (laughs) And he was like, we can get kind of close, but like, if you want that, it's going to cost about three times as much. And basically that killed all the margin of the product. Yeah. It broke your math. Yeah. And so not only had we totally stalled out from a sales standpoint, and I don't think we could have, I mean, you know, we, we probably could have put more money into it and marketed it a lot better, you know, maybe got to like 150,000 or so on that Kickstarter, which, which would have funded the project and would have, uh, would have brought that idea to life. But the idea we were trying to make wasn't possible anymore and so the rug just got pulled out from under me right as I was dealing with the emotions of like you know wow my my whole audience was tapped out in two days like what do I do um and so you know I think I was sitting I don't know if I think I might have got to Chicago by that point (laughs) and I was just sitting and I was like you know what we we have to cancel the campaign we have to give all this money back to all these backers and basically give up on this idea because it's just it's one it's not possible and two i don't think we're gonna sell much more of these things and it just it won't we won't make any money off this and so yeah we canceled the the second kickstarter campaign about i don't know two weeks in uh returned all the money you know we we didn't owe anyone anything over it it was it was just a bummer really and and drove back to colorado and and said okay now you know what do we do and and um and what we did I mean, it, I, I kind of took took a week to really think on it, right? But what we did was we decided to take all the R&D and all the thought and time and effort and engineering we had put into that new product and pour that into the existing product and make the existing product better. And it took us a few months, but then we came out with what we call version two of our American Artisan series, which is what we still sell today. And that took off. And um, we almost doubled the business that year, even with losing. I mean, we probably lost a hundred grand on just wasted marketing money that summer, um, but we still doubled the business. Yeah, I was gonna ask. So that so there was a real hard cost. I mean, and and again for a young company. I mean, you guys bootstrapped this thing, so you know, I mean, for a young company, a hundred thousand dollar loss. No matter how you yeah come out of it, still hurts. And and you know, and again, it's it's the it's a really interesting story. Because in one way you were successful and yet your success exposed your weakness. Yeah. Right. Like you're, which in hindsight, I'm sure now you're grateful that in two days you knew you had to fix some stuff. Right. Because sometimes (laughs) failing slow is the worst. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, and it's not that whole fail fast thing. It's the fact that sometimes you don't have control over it. Sometimes the market doesn't speak right away and you're kind of in that maybe land and you don't know what you knew is you knew people wanted it. And then within two days, you knew you couldn't build it and you had a, you had a disappointment, but you had recourse. You could give everybody their money back and you know, they got their money back. So 
Kickstarter, fortunately, was a platform where most people didn't see the projects complete. And so the, so you kind of failed in an environment that the expectation didn't ruin the brand. Right. But it, it took a lot of wind out of you because, you you know, in order to launch a product, you got to conceive it. You put all your, you know, it's like these, it's like children, right? You know, you had the emotional letdown of, wow, that didn't go the way we wanted it. What did you do that week when you were contemplating what to do next and you were dealing with the raw emotion of disappointment and frustration? I'm sure you, you know, had a little anger in there at, at the supply chain guy, at whatever it was yourself. How did you get through that? other than a bottle of scotch or whatever else you chose. <laughs> yeah, that that for sure. Bourbon um, was probably the <laughs> drink of choice at that time. You know, thankfully, I have a really good support system. Um, so I I sat down with, with my girlfriend and, uh, you know, she's an entrepreneur too. And so she's been there. And in that world for me, like when you have a bad day, talking about it and just getting it off the chest is good. And, and, and talking about it, you know, leads into that question of like, okay, so what are you going to do about it? And uh, that question for me always leads to a whiteboard. And and <laughs> so I just start, I start putting the goals and the dreams and the, and the long-term vision on the whiteboard and saying like, okay, maybe this idea didn't work, but what idea could work? And what can I put this energy and, and knowledge into now? that could uh, turn things around emotionally and financially. And, and that's, that's how we came up with the idea of, of version two of our, of our current product. Um, and, and just, you know, using that as an opportunity to, to pivot the company as, as it were, and just say, you know what, we're going to do things differently now. And, um, and, and, and we're going to be a better company because of this. And, um, you know, thankfully that, that worked out really well for us. Um, and I think it's going to end up being a happy story because we, we will in fact launch that product that when we try to, um, it's called the journeyman series. We're going to launch that, uh, later this year. Uh, I mean, <laughs> over two years later, we'll finally get it out, but, um, we we've come a long way since then. And so, um, we don't have to rely on almost any suppliers. Now we can do it all ourselves, which is one of the things I learned, um, is, in in high tech and advanced manufacturing you either need to pay a fortune for your suppliers or you need to do it yourself and if you're going to do it yourself it's going to take time so you got to find that long time that patch machine that that can help you justify that reinvestment yep yeah exactly yeah well that's a great that's this has been loaded with some good stuff so you started to transition into what i would call finding the calm and some of the things I know, congratulations, I know you, you recently added to the family in the last couple of weeks with with a new little one. And, and you know, sometimes that's a source of calm for people um, that are entrepreneurs. Sometimes it's a source of stress. <laughs> sometimes it's both. Um, but like, what are some of the things that RT does? Uh, I, you know, everybody's got their thing, right? But like that, that aren't related to business or maybe they are, but that help you find that creative space. You mentioned whiteboards, which I think is good, you know, but that's still very strategically tactical to your specific business. When you're really like stuck or when you're really just over it or when you just need to find your confidence or your, you know, that that again, which probably doesn't happen too often, but when it does happen, it can be pretty troubling. What is it that you do? Uh, what, are, what are the things that you've picked up over the years that other people, you know, could learn from? So for me, I get re-energized by hearing about other people's businesses and especially by helping other people uh, with helping other entrepreneurs specifically. That's why I, I think I get along so well with, with my girlfriend. Um, and we, yeah, we have, we have a two week old and a two year old now, and that's great. Family's awesome, but she and I hold the kids and write stuff on whiteboards, you know, and talk, talk business. Like yeah. we're, you know, our foreplay is, is talking about making money. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, right. it's just, that's yeah. who we are as a couple and it works really well for us. And that's probably weird for a lot of people, but that's just who we are. But, you know, for me, not on this. <laughs> uh, for for me, it's um, uh, she and I are part of a couple mastermind groups. You know where we get together once a month and and share experiences with other people. And and from that, 
um, we've started to advise some some other small business owners, and um, I, I actually invested in in a, another small business here in, in Colorado that is going to end up making more money than any business I've ever run myself. But um, it's all because you know we. I have these experiences and I can share them and it's something that someone else has never done or thought about. And they're like, man, why didn't I think about that? And it's, you know, you, you get, you get in that tunnel vision, you get in that silo and it's hard to, it's hard to get your mind out of it. So for me, I relax and I unwind and I relieve my brain from my own business by talking about or learning about other people's businesses um, and sometimes that's listening to how I built this, you know, the NPR podcast. Sometimes mm-hmm. that's uh, sitting in a mastermind group with some of my friends of other entrepreneurs. And sometimes that's basically like, you know, doing this kind of thing and, and talking to another entrepreneur, you know, on a podcast, you know, and, and just saying, just, just hearing that someone else is out there and they've done it. And, um, and especially when I can just drop one little piece of advice or nugget or something and that, and I see the light bulb and I see that help them, then I'm like, man, I just, I just helped somebody. I, I might've just changed somebody's life. That gives me the the motivation to go back into my own business and, and, and keep going. So that's what I do. Yeah. I, and, you know, we've had several conversations over the years, but I've, I've never actually asked you that or heard that. Uh, from you before, but I wonder if that's not why I was immediately attracted to you. I think, you know, I share a similar kind of DNA is the disease is is also the cure for me, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> the disease of not ever being able to not break down a business model. I Like I can't go to restaurants without wondering how they cover the overhead. I can't <laughs> like, it's a disease, right? Like it's yeah. a disease of the brain. And yet at the same time, it is where I can re-energize or find my own sense of calm when I'm stuck, when I can't think through our portfolio or our business in a way that's productive. It's like, first thing I want to do is call you up or call someone up who I've talked to in a while and say, hey, man, tell me about your business. Like, how's it growing? How's it? What, what's going on? What, what do you need? What's the problem? And that's part of why even the increase the dosage exists quite candidly is this is my this is my cure of meeting and, and hearing great stories from you, re, repackaging them for lessons that can be widely available to the broader community and and keep my own brain sharp. So um, so we have that similar uh, DNA. We'll, fa- we'll finish up with this. So for those of you who do not know and have not already been Googling them while you've been listening to this, RT Custer, we'll tell you where you can find them online, but the, the company, uh, Vortic Watches, V-O-R-T-I-C, watches.com, is where you can go check out his wares. I, um, you know, I I immediately bonded with you, and, and I was that customer that cared more about the transit experience than anything else because uh, I didn't come from an entrepreneurial family like you did, but I did have this legacy of hard work and character and these things that mattered, and that kind of set me up for success, I guess, DNA wise as an entrepreneur, even though I didn't know that's what I was going to be um, like you did. And my grandfather had an Elgin watch, which is one of the three kind of American artisan series that you guys started with. And and I didn't know it was. He had just given it to me. Uh, my dad had given it to me actually as a wedding gift. And so we've repurposed that now into this gorgeous Vortec timepiece. It's one of a kind. And it is a priceless asset to me. And, and you know, you guys um, do that on a, on a custom basis. But you also have these uh, amazing watches that come from all over the place that are being refurbished and, and turned into really gorgeous one of a kind conversation pieces that, that uh, everywhere I've worn that someone goes, well, that's a nice watch. And as soon as they don't re- they realize it's not a paddock or not a Rol- Rolex or something that they've heard of before it, it becomes a conversation. And, you know, for entrepreneurs, conversations usually lead to sales. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if nothing else, get yourself a Vortec watch so you can sell more of whatever it is you sell. Uh, that's my pitch for you. But how can we help you increase the dosage? What um, Close us out with 30 or 60 seconds on, you know, you've served our community uh, and been generous with your time and knowledge and wisdom. What is it that you are looking for uh, at Vortec? What do you need? Well, first off, if if you have the means to, to purchase a, a watch, obviously that's the most beneficial thing. If you don't or, or don't yet, I would say, um, you know, check check us out on on Instagram, especially as that's where I manage our Instagram. I, I try to put coolest pictures of the coolest watches there, and everyone knows someone that likes watches. So, share Vortic watches on Instagram or our website. 
with the person in your life that likes watches and, um, and get the word out. I think that's really, Chris, the, the biggest thing for me that I firmly believe that we can be successful and continue to grow exponentially because I still think even years in, most people in the world do not know I exist. So um, for every customer that says, hey, have you seen this watch company? They take old pocket watches, turn them into wrist watches. More times I can get people to say that every day, the more people know I exist and the more um, potential customers I can find. So uh, real simple, just tell your friends. Tell your friends. All right. And and we'll, we're will we going to be uh, doing a collaboration between Startup Drugs and, and Ortic. We're figuring that out. I, I, um, I'm excited about figuring that out with you because I think there's there's something around the legacy concept and, and entrepreneurs. And, and so, you know, we'll figure that out. And when we're ready for that, we'll we'll uh, let everyone that's listening to this or in our Startup Drugs community know uh, about what that is, because we're really trying to figure out the, the right way to do that. Um, that'll be most on target for our audience. It'll be on a limited basis. So we're excited to collaborate with you. Others that may want to collaborate, you could reach out to you, I'm sure, through Instagram or through the website and tell you what they're thinking. And without further ado, we will wrap up episode one. RT, it's been a pleasure. Great to reconnect, my friend. Continued success to you and congratulations to you and your girl on adding another healthy baby boy to the mix uh, and all the best this Father's Day, uh, which we are wrapping up as we speak. So Thank you for tuning in and thank you for joining us, RT. Take care, buddy. Thanks. See you later. Thanks for listening to this episode of Increase the Dosage. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned, as well as a few quotes for sharing on social media, head on over to startupdrugs.com forward slash podcast. And that's drugs with a Z. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at startupdrugs. And remember, the real risk is doing nothing. <laughs>